Hello and welcome back to Supposedly Fun. My name is Greg. I am here today to do a different sort of video for me, a sort of recommendations thing. I don't really have a reading goal for 2021, but one thing I had told myself I was going to do in my videos was recommend books based on what I read in the year. And I only did that once in a Friday Reads video that I will link down below that covered the first four books that I read in 2021 and no others. I have not done it since then. And I was thinking about it and how I wanted to get back to that and decided it might be a fun video topic. Sort of like an, if you like this book, try this book. And in my mind, this goes two ways. If you have read one of the books that I recommend, maybe you'll like the book that I read. My original thought was that if I get caught up on the books that I read in 2021, I can just wrap this back into a Friday Reads video. But I'm thinking that if this goes well, I might end up doing this as a sort of monthly thing, assuming I read enough books in a month that I can cover this. I'm going to do 10 books in this video, and then I'll do 10 books in another video, maybe next week, maybe the week after. We'll see how everything goes. So maybe this will be a monthly thing that I do. We'll see. Let me know if you like it in the comment section down below, or if you think it's more of a Friday Reads thing. I'd just be interested in what you have to say about that, since you're the person who has to put up with watching me. So yeah, might as well be happy. Just a quick note on how I tend to think about recommendations. So I worked at Borders, and a lot of the time people would come in and they would be looking for something to read, and they would tell you a book that they liked. And the tendency is to go for really popular books that are selling well based on that. And that works really well for the casual reader, but if it's somebody who's really immersed in the reading world, like I'm willing to bet many people who are following my channel probably are, they are probably already aware of these books. So I'm going to try to do a mix of popular books and maybe some lesser known books as well along the way. There's also a bit of a tendency with recommendations to try to match the subject matter of the book that somebody says they like perfectly. And I feel like there are chances that there are things about that book that might appeal to them in other books as well. So I'm going to try to do some recommendations that are a little close and some that are often a little bit of another direction and we'll see how this goes. So the books that were covered in my Friday Reads video, the one that I will link in the description box down below, were The Ballad of Songbirds and Snakes by Suzanne Collins, G is for Gumshoe by Sue Grafton, My Friend Dahmer by Durf Backdurf, and Conditional Citizens by Layla Lalami. Now, we have 10 books to cover and do recommendations based on those. So let's dive right in. The first book that I finished that was not covered in any, if you like this, try this, was The Prettiest Star by Carter Sickles. If you are unfamiliar, this is a book set in the 1980s and it is about a man who is dying of AIDS and who returns home to, I believe it's Ohio, with his family where he had not previously been out and over the course of the book, his family is forced to reckon with prejudice about both him being gay and the stigma of him dying of AIDS. And it is not a happy book, but I really enjoyed it. I liked it a lot. If you haven't read this book, I would recommend checking it out for sure. But if you're looking for recommendations based on this, I would say the first one is The Gifts of the Body by Rebecca Brown. This is certainly a lesser known book. It was published, I believe, in 1995. And it is a series of interconnected stories. Yes, it was published in 1995. Certainly a lesser known book. I know Sean the Book Maniac also read this and really enjoyed it. It is still in print, but you will likely have to order it. I ordered it through my local bookstore and it took a little longer. I think it took about three to four weeks to get at the time that I read it, which I believe was last year. And I just love this book. It is by a woman, Rebecca Brown, who worked as a home health care worker for people who were dying of AIDS back in the early 90s, and it is about a woman working as a home health care worker helping people who are dying of AIDS. And I wasn't sure I liked it in the beginning because it feels a little impersonal, but as the stories go along, you start to realize that it feels impersonal because she is putting up boundaries to protect herself from getting involved in the lives of these people that she is taking care of, and it is a really profoundly moving book and I would absolutely recommend it. And if you liked The Prettiest Star, another book I'm going to go with is a little more known. It's The Great Believers by Rebecca Mackay. This was my favorite book in the year it was published 
and I, I'm a big fan. I know some people don't enjoy this as much, but I really enjoy it. It is about a group of friends in the 1980s who are being impacted by the AIDS epidemic, and then there is also a portion that is set uh, more recently, I believe in 2016, maybe 2013, I can't remember exactly which, but it's a beautiful story and I really enjoyed it as well. And this is where I feel like you start to fall into the trap because the first two books that come to mind for me about The Prettiest Star both have to deal with AIDS specifically, and I feel like there are elements of The Prettiest Star that are certainly more universal. And one thing I would point out that is also probably lesser known is Intoxicated by My Illness by Anatole Braillard and other writings on life and death. Anatole Braillard was diagnosed with terminal cancer. I can't remember when this book was published, but he wrote it as he was dying, copyright 1992. And it's about his reaction to his diagnosis and the acceptance that he's going to die. It's a nonfiction book. And it's a little bit difficult to read, but it's also very interesting and addresses that topic of life and death. Not specifically about AIDS, but about cancer, and it's, it's a beautiful book, so I would recommend checking this out as well. Then we can move on to the next book that I read in 2021, which was The Prophets by Robert Jones Jr., and this was my favorite read of the year until I read The Yield by Tara June Winch. It is a fantastic book. If you have not read it, I would recommend picking it up but if you have read it and you're looking for something else to check out, I have some thoughts. First, I'll say that this is a love story between two men on a plantation, but it's also about the lives of the other people who are on the plantation and how slavery impacts them and their lives and their dreams and their ambitions about life. And it's also about heritage and the ways in which the colonial mindset that stole them away from Africa impacted their own beliefs about themselves. Again, it's a beautiful book. And if you liked it or are looking for similar reads, I think the most obvious examples would be Toni Morrison or James Baldwin, who are writers who clearly inspired Robert Jones Jr. and who he cites in his acknowledgments. And his writing does feel very reminiscent of them. But getting outside of them, I would say The Color Purple, which is obviously a very well-known book. It won the Pulitzer Prize. My caveat for it is that Alice Walker has promoted anti-Semitic comments in recent years, so she might not be an author that you would like to promote or support. If that is the case, I totally understand. I read The Color Purple a while ago and I've been meaning to reread it for a very long time and I love the book. So I'm just going to put it out there in addition to the context about the ideas that she has promoted so you can make up your own mind about whether or not this would be a book for you. The next one I want to mention is Homegoing by Yajasi, which is a fantastic book and it really gets to that idea of heritage and the impact of the slave trade and colonialism on the people who were impacted by it. Basically, it tells the story of two half-sisters living in Ghana. One of them is stolen and taken to the United States and sold into slavery, and the other one remains in Ghana. And every chapter jumps one generation ahead and goes back and forth between Ghana and the United States to tell the story of their ancestors and the ways in which their family trees diverge and perhaps converge and just the lasting impact of the slave trade. It's again a beautiful book. I have heard people say that they don't really appreciate this as much because since you always jump ahead a generation, characters don't repeat very much. It's almost like a short story collection at that point. However, I thought the structure of the book really served the story and what Yajasi was trying to do very well. And another book, unfortunately for this one, I feel like the spirit of the book stays very much in the idea of race in the United States, so it's hard to get away from that. Uh, but I would recommend Ruby by Cynthia Bond, which is another very difficult book, a very violent book about racism in the United States and particularly about lynching. That can make it a very difficult book to read, but it is a very good book as well and it was blessed by Oprah. So if you trust Oprah, maybe think about this one. The next book that I read in 2021 was Let Me Tell You What I Mean, Essays by Joan Didion. This was a collection of essays that had previously not been published in book form. If you know Joan Didion, you will probably enjoy it. I am a fan of Joan Didion's work. I read Slouching Toward Bethlehem in high school. I read The Year of Magical Thinking when it was released, and I loved it. Blue Nights is also fantastic. I've dabbled in some of her other work, but this was the first other full work of hers that I read. And if you are unfamiliar with Joan Didion, absolutely pick it up. You might do better with Slouching Toward Bethlehem or The Year of Magical Thinking. But this is a good collection too, as well as a really good intro. I don't read a lot of essays, so it's hard for me to 
lean into that because that this is an essay collection at heart. So I don't really have anything for you <laughs> that would be like a one-to-one -one comparison with this book, but I do have some ideas that are in the spirit of Joan Didion's writing. And the first one is Pictures at a Revolution by Mark Harris because Joan Didion is very concerned with California and what's more California than Hollywood. <laughs> But also she really likes picking at a popular thing and finding out what's really going on. One of the essays in Let Me Tell You What I Mean is about Nancy Reagan and the idea behind the image of her that is created. Also, there's an essay about Martha Stewart that does the same thing. And Pictures at a Revolution talks about the massive cultural change in Hollywood that happened in the 1960s and how it led to the more revolutionary cinema of the 70s by examining the five movies that were nominated for Best Picture in 1968. And it's a fantastic book and I think it stands up to a comparison to Joan Didion. The other thing I would suggest that kind of is in the spirit of essays is Assassination Vacation by Sarah Vowell. She is a nonfiction writer. This book in particular I think works because it is about the four presidents who were assassinated and tells stories about each of them that almost feel essay-ish in quality, but it's also a really well-written book that is also kind of funny and lets you know a lot about history as well as a modern context for it. And I deeply appreciated that, so I would recommend checking it out. Next we go to Real Life by Brandon Taylor, which was the next book that I finished in 2021. This deals with race, it's a coming of age story, it's a college story. There are a lot of different things that you could go with in here. It's also about a character who is really struggling with depression and grief and trauma. There are a lot of different directions I could have gone with recommendations for this. Here's what I came up with. First, I want to mention something that is actually on my TBR. I have not read it yet, but I've heard really great things. It's Stoner by John Williams. I figured real life is a college novel, this is a college novel, sort of a coming of age elements in both of them, so why not? I haven't read it, so I can't say it's totally in the spirit of real life, and I believe this book actually goes beyond the college years, but still, why not? Just think about it. I've heard really good things. The next one that I would recommend for anyone who is a fan of real life is my beloved The Secret Lives of Church Ladies. It also deals with the idea of grief and expectation and race in America, particularly when that expectation tries to put you in a box and that box starts to feel like a trap. And I think that is very much in the spirit of real life, even though they are doing very different things. This is a short story collection. I'm a huge, huge, huge fan. If you follow along on this channel, you already know that. And if you haven't read it, please check out The Secret Lives of Church Ladies my beloved. And the last book that I would recommend if you are a fan of real life or if you've been interested in real life is a classic gay novel, Dancer from the Dance by Andrew Holleran. This is about young men on the gay scene in the 1970s in New York and the ways in which prejudice against them and their own limited capabilities, their inability to have strong attachments or relationships or be out publicly damages them internally and closes things off and causes depression and anxiety and violence, ultimately. So I think it is very much in the spirit of real life. It does not have that racial element, but it does have that element of prejudice and depression based on what people expect from you. The next book that I finished in 2021 was Just As I Am by Cicely Tyson. It is a celebrity memoir. It's about her journey with the civil rights movement and depiction of her race in America and her journey through Hollywood. So there are, again, a lot of different angles I could go with. Traditionally, I am not a big fan of celebrity memoirs and this does start falling into that trap. I feel like they put a polish on the person's life and try to spin things in a certain direction and make everything look good. One memoir that I think gets around this is In Pieces by Sally Field. This is probably my favorite celebrity autobiography or memoir that has been written so far or that I've read so far. Sally Field really delves into complicated issues from her past and she's always questioning herself and her motives and why she did certain things and what traumas and experiences she had caused her to be the way that she is and the way that she grows up and shape her as a person. And I find that kind of reflection really interesting and I think it makes for a really fascinating book. Again, it's kind of missing that element of race, but if you are into celebrity memoirs and that's the part of Just As I Am that would appeal to you, please check out 
in pieces by Sally Field. More along the idea of race, because again, this does get into the idea of sort of civil rights and the progression of race relations in the United States in the latter part of the 20th century, I would recommend checking out March Volumes 1 through 3, a graphic novel series by John Lewis about his life and his role in the civil rights movement leading into the president. The climax of it is when Obama is elected president, which I don't think is a spoiler because it's history and the book is mostly concerned with the emotional movement up to that moment in history and it's a fascinating book. I'd really recommend checking that out. There are also sort of Me Too-ish elements in Cicely Tyson's memoir and one celebrity biography that I would say really leans into that is Fosse by Sam Wasson. I have a little bit of a problem with this book and that problem is that it's structured as a sort of countdown clock to Bob Fosse's death because Bob Fosse is a man who was deeply concerned with how much time he had left and how much he could fit in in his time on earth. And then when you get to the death, this is not a spoiler really, the book just ends. It doesn't really give you any of the context for his legacy after his death. And I feel like there's a big thing missing with that. And I've always been of two minds of this book because of that. However, it is very honest about Bob Fosse as an abrasive person. It's very honest about things that he did that were not very good and sexually harassing and sexual assault and things like that. So it's a difficult book, but I think it has an interesting piece of a puzzle that's on the other side of Cicely Tyson's book. Now we get to an interesting one because it's a, the first book that I really just kind of didn't like, which is Death in Her Hands by Otessa Moshfeg. I'm not an Otessa Moshfeg fan. It wasn't really a surprise that I didn't like this book either. It is about a woman who steadily loses her grip on reality after she finds a note saying that there is a dead body and they didn't kill the person. And even though there is no dead body, she just loses her grip on reality, trying to figure out what might have happened and things like that. So as I said, I am not a fan of Otessa Moshfeg and her writing style, but if you are, or if you're interested in it, I think you could do well with Jenny Offal, who wrote Department of Speculation, which is a book of hers that I really liked. She also wrote Weather, which I did not get along with and actually DNF'd, but I really was a fan of Department of Speculation. It's a book that sort of teases out the details of a marriage and it's sort of losing control. Uh, also, the narrator is a little bit unreliable, which ties in with Death in Her Hands as well, and I think it's just a much better written version of that. And since we're talking about unreliable narrators and the question of truth and accuracy in memory, I have to mention Burnt Sugar, which was another one of my favorite books from last year by Avni Doshi. Huge fan of this book. It really deals with the accuracy of memory and whether or not you can trust it, and it's a phenomenal book. I would recommend it as well. Otessa Moshfeg loves to play around with unlikable characters and unreliable narrators, and if that's kind of your thing, I would recommend checking out Leave the World Behind by Ruman Alam. This is a novel about two families who are sort of sprung together, four of them are staying in an Airbnb, and then the owners of the house that they are staying in return, saying that this unknown terrible event has occurred, and you don't necessarily know what's happening outside of the house and what's going on, and the details of that are sort of teased out as the book progresses. The characters are pretty deeply unlikable. I had a difficult time with this book because I was reading it at the height of election and pandemic stress. Now that we're a little removed from some of those things, maybe it would be a time to revisit this book if you are so inclined. And I would say you could also check out Shirley Jackson's We Have Always Lived in the Castle, which is sort of a classic unreliable narrator book. Or I would say you could check out The Paying Guests by Sarah Waters, which really plays with the idea of truth and unreliability in narration, and it's a great book as well. And finally, you could check out Fever Dream by Samantha Schweblin, which really plays with the idea of accuracy, and you don't really know what's going on in that book. I still don't think I really know or understand what's happening in Fever Dream by Samantha Schweblin, but it's a good book. I'm pretty sure I liked it. Then I read Utopia Avenue by David Mitchell, which is the story of a fictional band in the late 60s and early 70s and their progression of their legacy over time. And I'm not a huge fan of this book, so if that's a subject that appeals to you, I'd say maybe check this out instead. It's the final revival of Opal and Nev. This is an oral history about the duo of the title and how they came together as a band to form an album in the early 1970s. And the story gets complicated because as they are performing in a showcase to try to promote that album, there is a riot in which someone dies and 
ultimately the book really explores the topic of race, which is a huge diversion away from Utopia Avenue, which is not really concerned about that much at all. But it is kind of in the same spirit and wheelhouse. It's about a fictional band with a short-lived legacy from about the same period of time, and it goes from there. If you are more into like the David Mitchell writing style, I don't really know what to tell you <laughs> because I'm not a fan other than maybe check out other books by David Mitchell. The next book that I read was American Dirt by Janine Cummins and this is another one I was not a huge fan of so I would say skip this one. It's kind of a thriller about immigration. It, it has kind of problematic depictions of race and pretty much always defaults to the lowest common denominator way of talking about those things. It's much more concerned with being a thriller than being accurate or humane in any way. So maybe skip this one and look instead to Infinite Country by Patricia Engel, which is by someone who is actually from South America and is a much more humane version of this book. I read half of it and I was listening to it on audio, so I want to switch to the book version because I just love the writing. I think it's really well written and I want to experience that on the page. So I can't wait to finish that. Or you can check out The Perfect Nanny by Leila Slamani because American Dirt is trying to be a dramatic novel in the style of a thriller. And I think The Perfect Nanny is something that does that much better. Or you can read The Association of Small Bombs by Karan Mahajan, which is also a dramatic book that is told something in the style of a thriller and talks about complex issues of race and violence in a much more even-handed way. And the next book that I read was The Mirror and the Light by Hilary Mantel. Now, if you are thinking about reading this book, go back and read Wolf Hall first because I think you would benefit from the progression of the three books in this trilogy and go from there. If you're looking for things other than that, it's really hard because I don't read a lot of historical fiction, so I can't really point you to things that would be very similar. But if you are a fan of The Mirror and the Light or any of the other Hilary Mantel books, you are probably a fan of really great writing. And in that case, I would say check out Hamnet by Maggie O'Farrell, which won the Women's Prize for fiction last year. It's a fantastic book. It's also historical fiction. It follows Shakespeare's family, telling the story of the death of his son and the grief of his wife, and it's it's a beautiful book. And if you've already read Hamnet, I would say maybe check out I Am, I Am, I Am, which is a nonfiction book by Maggie O'Farrell, which is probably the next book of hers that I am going to be looking to get to. Another one you could really go for is A Fine Balance by Rohinton Mystery, which also takes a very specific time period and place. India in the 1970s and really goes in hard about the characters and the political climate and uh, it's a beautifully written book. It was my second favorite book in the year in which I read it and I absolutely recommend it a lot. It's also a bit of a brick but it's not a trilogy. And the final book I read in 2021 that I'm going to talk about here is Luster by Raven Leilani. This is a story about a young early 20s uh, black woman who is dealing with depression and trying to find her way into the world. I think it's depiction of grief and race is really interesting. I think the plot is very contrived and a little bit difficult, so if you feel like you'd be okay with that, go with this book. Otherwise, maybe check out some other things instead. And the first one I would recommend is, of course, my beloved The Secret Lives of Church Ladies, because it really grapples with depression and race and expectations on women in society. Again, it's just a fantastic book. You could also check out Blacklight, which are short stories by Kimberly King Parsons that really deal with depression in a very interesting way, often very uncomfortable to read, which is kind of the point. And then the final book that I would recommend if you are a fan of Luster or interested in Luster is Conversations with Friends by Sally Rooney. This is a book I really enjoyed on one level because the things that Sally Rooney does as a writer are really interesting and there's a lot going on underneath the surface of this book that shows the grief and the mental state of its characters. I didn't quite engage with the book so again it's really that sense of difficulty understanding the characters and where they are at but it does it in a more interesting way I think. I have not read Normal People but if you enjoy this and Luster maybe check out that one as well if you have not already. And I'm gonna leave it there. I will do another video at some point, hopefully soon, where I talk about the next 10 books that I read in 2021, and if you like them, try some more books. So if you are interested in that, make sure you hit subscribe and follow along. And if you have made it to this point, thank you for that. If you have other thoughts and other recommendations, please let's turn the comment section into a resource. So leave a comment with your recommendation based on any of these books or what you think people should read instead of any of those books down below. You know what to do. So thank you for your time. As always, I will be back. Until next time, happy reading.